Okay. Hey, everyone. I got Tony with us from Kansas now. Uh, so, Tony, just give us a little bit of your background, where you started, now you're here. All right. This is going to be good. So, um, I started my undergrad at University of Minnesota Duluth. <laughs> Uh, I was actually an engineering student. I was doing a lot of computer science stuff, and I don't know, this is actually going to come full circle, so really good story. So I started doing computer science stuff. I think at that time in my life, my priorities revolved around playing hockey, lifting weights, and snowboarding. So uh, I wasn't, I don't think I was feeling the whole engineering thing at the time. Switched over to exercise science, and I quickly realized that a lot of the things I like about engineering, solving problems, figuring out how things work, how to make something better, uh, applies to exercise science and kinesiology. Um, at least it should apply. It should be how you're thinking about things. Uh, how can I make this person perform this task better? What things about that person can I change? Uh, my senior year at UMD, I had a strength conditioning class with the head strength coach at UMD, and it really tied everything together, exercise, physiology, which I loved, and the applied nature of our field. And uh, I realized there's a lot of things that we just don't know about strength and conditioning, um, and that people can have different opinions. And, uh, yeah, it actually kind of, I wouldn't say that I butted heads, but there are things that uh, people said or you heard from people that kind of just didn't make sense. A lot of reputable people, it just doesn't make sense. If you understand basic physiology, a lot of things out there might not make sense. And uh, that led me to, we actually use the Essentials of Strength Conditioning book in that class. So NSCA was on my radar, and uh, I went to their website, saw that there was a handful of um, recognized NC or NSCA schools uh, for master's programs. So those were all on my list. And then what I started doing was looking at um, JASA Journal of Strength Conditioning Research to see who was publishing a lot of research. And uh, shocker, uh, Fullerton is publishing a bunch of stuff. So um, uh, I had Wisconsin Lacrosse on my list, and I had Cal State Fullerton on my list, San Diego State on my list. Uh, no offense to anyone from San Diego State, but I am happy that I ended up at Fullerton. Uh, I still talk to some of the people I met at, um, Wisconsin Lacrosse, uh, good people. And actually, as someone just graduated from Kansas, he's now working at Wisconsin Lacrosse, uh, Matt Andre. So, uh... That was me in Cal State Fullerton. I actually started doing environmental exercise physiology with Dan Juddelson uh, before he orphaned me to go work for Nike. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I still have a lot of um, interest in environmental physiology. There's some cool questions to be answered there. Um, but that led me to have a choose another advisor, and uh, Dr. Brown was kind of a no-brainer. So started working with Dr. Brown, uh, did some non-local fatigue. Now people refer to it as non-local fatigue. At the time when I was doing my thesis, there wasn't really a word for terms to describe uh, fatiguing one part of your body and then exercising another part of your body as far as like uh, resistance exercise is concerned. Um, so I did that for my thesis to see how uh, fatiguing the upper body affects squat performance, uh, strength, exercise, so we're doing 80% uh, of one RM and moving at two seconds per concentric eccentric um, phase, and found some interesting things there. Uh, through that time, actually, Dr. Weir, who I'm studying under now, wrote all of the software that we use to collect and analyze our data uh, for my thesis, and largely all the studies that are <laughs> done in the strength lab at Cal State Fullerton. And uh, Dr. Brown hooked me up with Dr. Weir, said that, you know, I think we do some good stuff. So led me to Kansas, and uh, I've been here 
doing a variety of things. Um, so the first thing we started looking at was uh, transcranial direct current stimulation. It's kind of a new hot area of research right now. There's actually a new product out called the Halo. Um, and I think they're they're marketing it really hard, but transcranial direct current stimulation is such a new area of research. I have, you know, there's just so many things going on with it. No one really knows what's going on there. I was actually at ACSM and presented some of my research there, and there's a crowd around my poster, mainly people just uh, venting about how no one knows what the hell is going on with transcranial direct current stimulation. Um, so we're doing that. We're doing some more non-local fatigue stuff, and we're doing some muscle temperature stuff. Uh, shockingly, no one really knows how hot muscles get during resistance exercise, and uh, depending on how hot they actually get, uh, muscle temperature might be one of the reasons why fatigue, uh, uh, I guess, can onset sooner during a bout of resistance exercise, but we have no idea how hot muscles actually get during a uh, resistance training workout. Um, so that's, I guess, we dabble with way too many things uh, all at once. We're also doing, um, been doing a lot of software programming. So I write software to collect and analyze data. I also write software to trigger uh, stimulators, like muscle nerve stimulators. So trying to, a lot of people have heard of um, interpolated twitch or some sort of measure of voluntary activation. And traditionally, that's been done isometrically. But um, as you may know, if you look at research and if you, I guess, kind of logically, things change once you start moving. So if you move at different velocities, maybe you have different amounts of voluntary activation. But the only way to uh, measure that is if you, you have to be able to write a program that detects where the limb is in space and is stimulating it at the same time um, for different velocities. So trying to do a measure of um, voluntary activation or interpolate, dynamic interpolated twitch, uh, and we piloted that. We'll probably start collecting real data on that sometime in the spring. Uh, they have got a lot of stuff going on. On top of uh, taking classes and teaching, so yeah, I'm not doing anything over here really, just kind of hanging out. So while we're still like on the topic of school, what was your involvement like when you were at Fullerton uh, for the craft program? How involved were you? Uh, I was involved as I could be, as actually pretty much all I did. Uh, I really dedicated myself at Fullerton. Um, I mean, when you're a master's student and you have aspirations of going on to get your PhD. Uh, if you really want it, you got to commit to it because uh, there's a lot of other people like you who want to get their PhD and there are very few fully funded spots out there. But, you know, also, it's easy to do that. Fullerton. It was really easy to do that Fullerton for me because there's so many interesting things going on and uh, I really had no interest in doing anything else other than just being in a variety of labs. Uh, helped out a lot with uh, Dr. Galpin's muscle biopsy stuff and muscle fiber typing stuff. Uh, the first summer, we ran gels for Katie McLean's um, thesis. Um, so I spent a lot of early mornings and late nights with Katie, uh, Jose, Kylie, uh, some good times. I think the the <laughs> there's a classroom right next to that lab, and uh, they didn't like how much fun we we're having in the biology department. So we had some uh, talkings too. But uh, <laughs> uh, I was also the lab director um, under Dr. Brown in the strength lab. So anything that was happening in there, uh, I'd help out as much as I could. But uh, it's it was a really amazing uh, environment over there where you have a lot of strength coaches, um, people who want to be strength coaches or who are strength coaches at the time or who were strength coaches at the time, still are strength coaches, um, and just talking about why we do things, should you do this, should you do that, what evidence is there out there for this, bring your evidence to the table if you have it. 
you have an idea, especially if your idea doesn't mesh well with someone else's, uh, you better have a reason why you why you think that. Um, actually, uh, Ramsey, Nigem, and uh, Jimmy Stitz. Uh, Jimmy Stitz is with uh, United States Olympic Committee strength coach. Um, I think he's working with volleyball right now uh, or water polo. Um, and Ramsey Nigem is the newest head strength coach at uh, Sacramento Kings. So congratulations to him. And then my buddy uh, Leland Barker, who's a PhD student at uh, UNLV, we would all get together on Thursdays and get hammered and talk about training theory and general strength conditioning. We even got on the top of uh, motor control one night. And I will say this on record. I want everyone to hear this. Uh, Ramsey had this idea of motor control. Uh, and he was sticking to his guns. Everyone was against his idea. And just the other day, I, might have, I have no perception of time. This was probably like a year ago. But he admitted that he now thinks otherwise. And then he's, he jumped on our bandwagon. So people's ideas can change depending on a, you know, what new information they encounter. We call it Training Theory Thursdays. Just a really good environment. And there's so many people over there who are uh, just a, amazing people who are going on to do great things. You know, I overlapped with that Cal State Fullerton people. Uh, Nicole Moyen, one of the smartest people I know, working for Fitbit now. Um, Andrew Dubois at USC. But uh, just to, if you want to do something in the field, uh, you can do it there. Uh, just a great place to be, great connections to make. And, would like any job, um, you can be super smart, be really driven, but if you aren't around the right people, uh, things might never come to fruition. So I'm really lucky to have been there and to be where I'm at now, uh, largely due to people like Dr. Brown and everyone in the lab, really. Okay, you always had like a, a way of asking questions. You weren't ever combative in any way, but you wanted people to really explain themselves. So I would say you were more Socratic in terms of your questioning of people, or, and you'd be demanding of what, um, they couldn't just simply come in and make claims to you. How did you ever, how did you do that without being, like, without making enemies? Because I feel like <laughs> you challenged people for sure. I think I've learned. Uh, I think that my senior year and undergrad, um, you know, you have a successful head strength coach at UMD, and uh, what was his name, I forget his name, but won a national championship, D1 hockey national championship, D2 football national championship, multiple ones, so very successful, but um, just because you're a successful coach in anything, doesn't mean that you're doing things the best way. And I never challenged him personally, but well, well, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? But if something was said in the book, and you know, I'm an NSCA guy, like, and I'll always be an NSCA guy, but there are things even in the NSCA book that I don't agree with. Yeah. Um, so I think that you kind of learn over time, just like anything, uh, there are better ways and worse ways to approach things. And, uh, I think a lot of times I like to just put it on someone else. Uh, I actually forgot that I had said this one time, and Albert and Daniel and uh, a bunch of guys from the lab, by guys and girls from the lab before I left to go to Kansas, threw me this going away party, and they all said <laughs> uh, their most memorable, I guess, experiences with me. And someone said that uh, I was having a conversation with someone about something. I think it. I think it was something about like I for, I even for, I forget what it was, but uh, apparently I I didn't think that someone had uh, a good reason to think something, and they were just sticking to their guns. And I think I said, uh, I'm not saying that I disagree with you. I'm saying that someone way smarter than me disagrees with you. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, you know, you can, you can also do that. Just say that, hey, this guy who's really smart says this, and this is his area of expertise. I'm not an expert in that field, but I know that he's definitely an expert in that field, and uh, he definitely thinks otherwise. Uh, but 
they have an open mind because you know even the smartest people um, you know can be wrong and you really only know what you know at the time and new evidence can always come out and but you got to be aware of it and you have to be open minded and not just you know stick to your guns for I don't know whatever reason for ego purposes or something and my biggest fear is probably just being not being wrong but thinking that uh, that I'm aware of something and that something's true when it might not be true. I don't want to, you know, go around saying uh, things that can be very influential if they're not, I don't know, things that we're very certain of, like the force velocity curve. Like, yeah, you know, if you're moving something heavier, you're going to be moving slower. Like, I can, I'll scream it off the top of the mountain, but. You know, if there's something like transcranial direct current stimulation, I'm not going to go out there and say that, yeah, put these electrodes on your head, run a current through it, and you're going to be an elite athlete. Um, I would just be very careful about uh, what I say and, um, I don't know, just be curious about things. Uh, and that's, I think, what, what drives me really is just the curiosity to, to know things. I'm a little bit more selfish in that uh, I'm not necessarily, my, my mindset isn't, I want to help people. My mindset's really, uh, well, that's really interesting. I wonder why that happens. Or uh, what's most interesting is if coaches have these ideas, and that's where you know you can really start getting some interesting ideas. Oh, really? It, that's an interesting idea, or this is an interesting phenomenon. Um, well, test it. You now, there's really only one way to find out. What sort of questions should coaches be asking you as a, as a scientist? Anything that they've thought about. Uh, if they're a good coach, they're thinking about everything. Why, why do I have... And here's a fact. Uh, no coach in the history of coaching has ever had the perfect program for any athlete because there's way too many variables that could be altered in order to know that this is the best this is the best program for sure but they chose this program for a variety of reasons but i'm sure if they're you know thinking about what they're doing they've thought well i don't know maybe i shouldn't do that maybe i should do this what if i did this i don't know if i should do that that's a risk i don't know if i want to take that risk um, maybe there's a researcher out there who can find a population and answer this question i don't know if like example my thesis, I don't know if, uh, if I can get away as a strength coach with rotating through bench press, an upper body pull, a squat exercise in my strength workouts. I mean, it would be a really long workout if I didn't rotate through exercises, but am I robbing uh, athletes of power and repetitions? Uh, I don't know, but we can figure it out uh, if we have a research, researcher who has the resources uh, and is capable of pulling the study off. So, I, I mean, I wish that I could have conversations with strength coaches regularly to see what, what things are going around in their mind. What do they want to know? Because that's, those are the types of questions that I will always want to answer, is questions that are going to be influential, questions that it's not interesting if you're not thinking about it, Oh, I don't know. Is this motor unit active or not? I don't know. Really, who gives a crap about that? But there are some very applied questions that strength coaches inherently have to be thinking about, and I I want to know what those questions are. What kind of uh, research or books are you keeping up to right now? What are you doing as far as keeping up to date on all the information that's out there? It really. It really is all right now related to any type of research I'm doing. So right now, I'm really hitting the transcranial uh, direct current stimulation stuff hard. Um, I'm also working on a, another, there's another iron in the fire, um, an M-wave kind of review, maybe meta-analysis if there's enough data out there. But uh, I don't... Being a PhD student, honestly, I don't have the time to 
Um, or maybe I'm not making the time. Maybe I'm not making the time to be listening and watching things that I used to watch. I used to watch a lot of, like, um, Lane Norton and uh, Jacob Wilson and... Uh, I'm always on social media. I'll be looking at stuff on Twitter. I follow a lot of people on Twitter, so I still look at that stuff. And that's maybe, that's, in my opinion, I've always spread this word. If you guys probably heard me say it in the lab like a long time ago, like, get on Twitter. Get on Twitter. There's so many amazing researchers on Twitter. There's like some of the most amazing researchers in the world on Twitter. Like Roger Anoka and Simon Gandivia are on Twitter. It's crazy. So like, dudes who have written textbooks and formulated a lot of knowledge about what we know, how the neuromuscular system works, and they're on Twitter. It's absolutely amazing. Um, you can get an absurd amount of relevant knowledge on Twitter, or at least it'll point you in the right directions to start looking into um, things that are highly relevant. I guess I, I should this this fall we're doing, like, talking about all the things that uh, <laughs> I'm trying to do. Uh, it's maybe overwhelming to think about it. This fall, we're doing a study to see, investigate this high load, low load argument that's kind of been going on between um, primarily the Bill Kramer group and um, um, Stuart Phillips group, which are, both groups are absolutely amazing research groups. Everyone knows, everyone knows who Bill Kramer is, and most people know who uh, Stuart Phillips is now. Um, but there's some very interesting questions regarding high load versus low load training. Can you just pick up a, a light weight and lift it until you can't lift anymore and have all of your motor units completely activated at failure? Uh, interesting question, and I think we can approach it from uh, some cool ways. Uh, we have some great technology at Kansas. We can look at uh, motor unit recruitment, motor unit firing rates using uh, the Delsys DEMG system. And uh, we have nerve stem, so we can do twitches uh, during contractions, after contractions, basically tackle the neuromuscular system from every every aspect. Uh, we don't have a transcranial magnetic stem, which is the only thing I really want that we don't have. Um, but that that idea spawned from you know these arguments that people are basically having on Twitter, having on you know point counterpoints that are posted on Twitter that obviously they're not published on Twitter, they're published articles in peer reviewed journals. Uh, but things that are interesting to people are interesting to me because you can contribute something uh, to the conversation and you know help uh, <laughs> help at least uh, approach that. Um, I guess, end goal of maybe answering this, this question once and for all. Maybe not once and for all, because it might be different between muscles. But, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, I think the more you're around people who have um, polarizing ideas, or you hear about this information, you need to be directly around them or, you know, be going to dinner with them or anything like that. But just uh, to make sure that you're aware of the things that people are people are talking about or these polarizing ideas or ideas that are highly influential. Um, certainly one of them that seems to be really hot right now. So uh, hopefully we can contribute to that conversation. So as far as those you follow on Twitter and research, how are you sifting through all that information to know what's right and what's wrong? Um, to be very uh, objective, I have no skin in the game. You know, if if all the motor units are recruited at task failure, cool. If they aren't, fine. But uh, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. That's not going to. I'm just trying to provide a good science so that people can make their own decisions. Um, I'm I'm probably not going to answer this question with one study and. No one can answer every question in the world with one study, but uh, it's it's not really difficult to uh, um, I don't know, get lost in things. Actually, what I what I do when I'm trying to uh, start a research project, or let's say I'm doing a low load versus high load thing, I'll make a spreadsheet and I'll have 
all the articles that are um, related to this topic on there and have the methods, um, important things like, I mean, things that could differ slightly between studies that I could, that I think probably affect the results highly. Have notes for that, notes about what they found, um, and you can start creating this, you have the storyboard that's kind of evolving in front of you, and you can see kind of where these discrepancies might lie or what dots might start being connected and maybe what dot you can add. Or if you're just writing a discussion, maybe you're just trying to say, okay, well, why did we find this? Uh, well, this person found this, this person found this, this person found this. If you just look at it all kind of scattered, it can be easy to get lost. But if you put it all up there, you can kind of start seeing um, maybe why some authors found this, some authors found otherwise. But uh, yeah, if you're just going through reading abstracts, you, it's easy to just get overwhelmed. Be like, okay, well, I don't know, someone found this, someone found that. I, I don't know what's going on. I, maybe I should just not care about this. Uh, but, you know, there's, if the data are really what they are, then there's a reason why they were that way. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a difficult thing to synthesize information and know where to look. But in order to really, I don't know, get usable information on any topic, you really have to sink your teeth into it and not just, you know, rely on one abstract. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, every every study is important, and I really only follow people, researchers on Twitter. If I see people that are posting just stuff that's not related to research, I will probably just unfollow them uh, because I'm, I don't know, I don't really, if I want to watch or hear about sports gossip, I'll watch ESPN. So. Well, you've never been shy about asking questions, so um, who have you reached um, who have you reached last and had a question for? What researcher and asked them about their methodologies or their theories? Because I know you've never been shy about um, asking questions that you want to know the answer to. Um, well, I can actually I contributed on Twitter. It was like I'd never post stuff. I'll repost awesome tweets that people post on Twitter. Uh, but I'm just way too lazy to make real tweets myself. But I saw that. So this is a. I mean, I hate to bring up like a, like a. I don't know a topic like this. But um, there's been, I don't know, gossip, drama, whatever you want to call it, with Jacob Wilson and uh, some studies that have been done at HMB, and uh, someone posted a link to uh, a table from one of his articles. And it's, it's kind of misleading out of context because uh, all of the standard deviations for, for every measure are the same between groups, which if you were doing traditional statistics, you'd look and be like, that's like, that's impossible. There's no way that the standard deviations for every single measure are the same between groups. It's just, there's no possible way. But, and everyone is jumping on this bandwagon, like, I'm not saying that, I'm not taking any side here, but you know, they're pitchforks in hand. Uh, this is like, I can't believe this. This is like, you know, the greatest evidence in the world to say that some fishy's going on. But it was an ANCOBA that was around the data, and in ANCOBAs, uh, since it's being covariate, the standard deviations end up being the same between groups. And uh, uh, I've taken a lot of stats classes. It's actually one of the things I had in mind when I came here is uh, I want to have as many tools as I can possibly have uh, so I can do more research and analyze things different ways. I could have the same data set and maybe not be analyzing it the best way I could possibly analyze it if I don't even know about all these all these statistics out there. And our field is so far behind as far as statistics are concerned. Um, so I'm really trying to broaden my horizons as far as uh, gaining as many statistical tools as I can. Uh, but that was one thing. I mean, some amazing researchers were, you know, posting there saying, like, yeah, that is, you know, 
there's no explanation for that, but there was an explanation. It was named Goga. Um, aside from from that, I think when I first <laughs> this is a, actually a good story. I don't know how many people are gonna watch this. Uh, <laughs> there's three people so far. <laughs> so uh, when I first got to Kansas, we we would go over in preseason and run speed squat tests on the KU basketball players with Dr. Fry, Andy Fry is here uh, at Kansas as well, an amazing researcher. Um, so we'd go over there and do speed squats. And afterwards, Coach Hudy, who's gotten, you know, great strength coach, gotten awards, um, she brought us over to the Sparta jumps. I'm going to make so many enemies uh, off this story. I don't even know if I should finish the story. I essentially asked, so it's, it's a force plate. You jump on it, it gets, spits out three, three little um, bar plots, separate bars. They're called proprietary names like load, explode, and something else. And uh, she's saying how the athletes jump on this, and you get these values, and if this happens, it means this. If this happens, it means that. If this happens, you had a greater likelihood of injury. So I asked. So, and one of these bars is related to, like, strength or power or something like that. So I asked, okay, so if you have an athlete that has their strength or power, power that's too high relative to something else, are you going to make them get less powerful or less strong? And uh, I think I questioned her authority with that question. That was maybe one, one of those times where my questioning should have been a little bit more uh, uh, carefully worded. Um, More deliberate. I don't know, but <laughs> I don't know if this was like the driving factor. But we haven't been invited back to do speed squat testing. <laughs> uh, That's awesome. That's one of those things. Like uh, you know, I hate to say it, but like if you get a bunch of PhD students, you know, we're at the University of Kansas. We're studying with guys like Dr. Andy Fry, who's a pioneer in skeletal muscle physiology, Bill Gallagher, Paul Stater, amazing skeletal muscle physiology guy, Joe Weir wrote a textbook on stats, does a lot of work, one of the most cited <laughs> papers like in our field, uh, a lot of neuromuscular stuff, and you start saying, you know, like, be careful about the things that you say, because, you know, it, you say some, a lot of people would like to predict injury in our field. And if you think you can jump on a force plate and look at these bars and tell me that you can do that, then uh, uh, I mean, you better have some, <laughs> some serious evidence. That's awesome. That's a good, good. But it brings up a, a good point. Like, I'm not saying you shouldn't gather that data. A lot of people are gathering a lot of data, but if you don't have someone to sift through that data and... Uh, and make, I guess, transform the data to something that's usable. So, like, if you believe that a test that you're doing before your workout can tell you something about maybe how that workout should be changed or maybe how much playing time this person should get or whatever it may be, then how are you going to make use of that data in such a short period of time? So someone jumps on this thing. How do you know that 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 jump is an aberration relative to all their other jumps that they completed in, I don't know, the week before, two weeks before, a month before, last year. Uh, how are you legitimately going to make use of that? There's no way your head strength coach is going to have enough time to do that. Probably not an assistant strength coach. Like, you have to have someone who's technologically capable of probably doing some, writing some software where I click a button and it's, taking all the files that have ever been created, ever been collected for this athlete and creating some sort of graph or something like that that's, that's usable. So the jump's completed, you press a button, it's, it has your I don't know, profile of whatever you think's important, whether it be like a velocity variable or some sort of proprietary values from something else. Uh, there's that's the only way that that's ever going to be useful to you immediately is if you have all that information available to you, probably graphically, uh, because just looking at numbers, you're probably not going to be able to 
to figure out if that's an aberration or mm-hmm. maybe what's going on with that. Uh, and that's, I don't know, something that I've definitely been thinking about and maybe an area that I, that I want to get into with all the programming I've been doing. Um, you think about stuff like, and that's the stuff that I want to hear about, like, okay, what, what things do strength coaches think uh, are useful indicators for predicting uh, fatigue or injury or readiness, stuff like that. Um, and, you know, okay, well, we'll collect it and we'll analyze it and we'll figure it out. I mean, there's that's the only way. We're going to have to have a lot of data. Um, but if we have the data, then someone's capable of figuring it out. Uh, it's just a matter of time and capabilities. And if you have some serious programming capabilities, and you can do it in much less time. <laughs> yeah, I've thought about this too, like the availability of real-time data, just like um, Coach Hootie has over there. What do we do with that information that we do collect? So it's not bad to have more information, but um, actually making it usable, that's the tough part, and that's what you're, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Because... I mean, I could see us as coaches making assumptions based on the information we have, yet it's, we, we, I don't know how good we are at making those sort of, um, or extracting what's good from the information rather than just having the Or even simple things. You guys are maybe more connected in this than I am, but, you know, you have, uh, like, strength data, volume data, um, stuff like this available. Most strength coaches probably have records of this this information. And, I mean, is your program doing what you think it's doing? How, how much scrutiny are you putting yourself under to determine if your program is actually doing what you think it's doing? Do you think your program is increasing your power across the season? Okay, well, what information do you have to suggest that? Okay, but what power is it improving? Is it improving your low velocity power, your power under heavy loads, your high velocity power, you know, there's there's a and there's a lot of information there and a lot of really useful information there, but are people even looking at that? That's I mean, probably thought about it and maybe people are afraid to you know, maybe put themselves under that that scrutiny, but uh, and if you want to be the best you can possibly be, I think those are the types of things you should be doing. And it's, it's just re- also a resource thing, you know, you can't do everything. Yeah. Uh, I understand that. Um, but if you could do everything, <laughs> you'd probably want to have some nerd around to, you know, make use of all this stuff, because, I mean, it's, I mean, yeah, it's tough to collect. You go through a lot of trouble to collect this data, so why not make the most of it? That's sort of cool because we're working with a, a local pro hockey team. I don't even know if we're supposed to say or not, but that's a, what was most impressive about their strength coach when he came in was he he told us directly, he's like, I, I want nothing to do with the data collection, but um, he is putting himself under scrutiny like that, and I thought that was more impressive than any performance that I saw um, from any of the athletes was his his willingness to put himself under scrutiny. Yeah, I mean, being in around a lot of strength coaches, everyone thinks that they have the special recipe. I know that what I'm doing is the best way to do things. Okay, well, how do you know that so and so over at, you know, this national championship winning team is doing better things, or maybe that they're just winning because they have better players? Uh, what information do you have to suggest that what you're doing is making your athletes better? Maybe not even just, you know, my athlete can lift more weight. That's not enough. Just lifting more weight doesn't mean that you're a better athlete. That means you're better at lifting that weight. Um, Surely there are a lot of, you know, elite athletes that aren't, uh, Usain Bolt's not going to win a freaking weightlifting medal in the Olympics. Uh, There's just these measures that you have in the gym are not performance measures. Their strength measures, or your strength at this velocity, your strength at this velocity and this movement, this very specific movement, 
Um, if you think that those values are related to your on-field performance, then show me the data. Well, if we're able to answer those questions, if we come up with a battery attested representative of sports performance, that's exactly what we want. Yeah. So I mean, people have just, talked about this type of thing for a long time. People talk about like the Wonderlic test. Like, oh, I mean, do you need to? How smart do you need to be to be a? I don't know, a linebacker in the NFL or something like that. But I mean, is we have combines for nearly every every sport now. Every major sport, I think, has a combine. I don't know if soccer has a combine. They probably have a combine. Yeah, um, I think Cal State Fullerton doesn't run it, so is it not, is it a combine if that's not happening? I don't know. Um, but uh, people obviously think that something like that's happening, but um, I don't know how much real data there is out there to suggest that any of these performance variables or what combinations, this is a statistical question, maybe there's one variable that might may or may not be correlated to performance. Uh, what if you have, you know, big back squat, um, short vertical jump? Maybe you have big back squat, high vertical jump. So is there an interaction there? Uh, there's a lot of statistical things that, that might be necessary to start answering these types of questions, and these things might be nested within each other. Um, but, yeah, we need, <laughs> we need the data, and we need to have the tools, and the manpower, and the hours. Uh, but until we start really, truly trying to do that type of stuff, uh, it's not going to happen. And I think that, uh, you know, Professional sports overseas, like in England and Europe, they're on the right path. Their researchers are integrated in with their pro teams, and they're doing these things every day. They're trying to answer these types of questions. Here, we're totally behind the ball. You have athletes who are making millions and millions and millions of dollars, but you're not going to hire one nerd to make, like, $80,000. Someone will probably do it for less than that. Someone will probably do it for, like, you know, sixty thousand dollars. That's like, I don't know, one game for a lot of athletes, and you could gather, you can figure out things that could save, you know, a lot of games in the future for other higher-paid athletes. Not even just the current athletes. Uh, it's just mind-boggling to me to to see that happening in the United States, where there's the NFL makes more money than any any sports team in any sports league in Europe, I think it's like NFL, I want to say NBA, and then maybe English Premier League or something like that. But NFL is definitely top, and they don't really have that going on. So, uh, I don't know, or at least not to my knowledge, of that level of integration. And uh, I mean, part of it's, I don't know, we have this culture, and, you know, head coach is the calls the shots. Strength coach, in most cases, head coach is calling the shots, even if the strength coach says something. I don't know how much weight the strength coach's word is going to carry just because they're a strength coach or not a head coach. But uh, there's just a lot going on there, and uh, uh, I imagine it only will take one successful team to start doing that before everyone jumps on board because no one wants to get left behind. But uh, it just seems crazy to me that that's not the case over here where it's just so integrated over there. People are doing their PhDs with English Premier League teams trying to answer these specific types of questions. That's the research they're trying to do, and that's it's crazy that we're not trying to do that type of stuff. Now, we'll be talking to someone on Monday who uh, he's doing his PhD at UCSU, and um, I went to their conference last, last December, and I was talking to them about their PhD program, and as a PhD student, get to work with one of the athletic teams, so that's kind of cool that they get to do that integrated research and working with teams. I mean, we're applied exercise physiologists. How many athletes come in our lab? None, unless they're a researcher. It's just not, we've got a bunch of uh, KU runners in our lab to help out, but, you know, we, obviously, uh, it's, there's this disconnect that we can't really... People complain about, oh, this study was done on non-athletes. Okay, well, give me some fucking athletes. <laughs> for. Can, can you air that? You're, you're going to have to bleep that out afterwards. Oh, it's live, man. There's no bleeping anything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. But you know, it, here's the thing, and people don't want to these are elite athletes. You don't want to, you know, screw up their training that apparently is the best it can possibly be. But uh you know, we don't have to do it that way. We could do it another way. Just collect data and, you know, see what happens. It doesn't have to be some sort of crazy intervention. But, it's hard because the the coaches have all the answers, so we can't really have their data. <laughs> yeah, you can't even watch their practice. I mean, like, even at Cal State Fullerton, we have such a hard time getting athletes. I can, I can attest to that one. I won't say what. <laughs> yeah, was that? Was that? I can say good things about the team I worked with. They're awesome. Yeah, well, our, yeah, our women's soccer team is pretty badass, but I can't, I can't really speak for the rest of our athletic department. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see where this one's, where this one's going. Yeah. Hey, but the uh, yeah, the most successful team was willing to provide you with athletes at Cal State Fullerton. And the baseball team's kind of fallen off a bit, but women's soccer is not. No, definitely not. So, I don't know, maybe kind of telling. <laughs> so as far as um, oh. outside, or, um, even though you're doing all this research, PhD, you did your master's program, what do you do outside? What do you do to kind of can you see my Snapchat today? <laughs> I don't even think I follow you on Snapchat. Oh, uh, you're missing out. No, I really don't. I honestly, if you you've heard things I've said, so I'm really not doing much other than sitting in the lab, planning camping trips. Yeah, <laughs> writing <laughs> programs. Um, Lawrence Lawrence is a super cool place. Uh, I I was super ignorant about coming out here. I mean, I lived in California for like. I don't know, 13 years in Minnesota for like 11 years. Um, been out here for two years. And when I came out here, it's like Kansas. So uh, it's like the South, right? Like it's going to be really conservative and uh, I'm going to have to really watch what I say and do. Uh, but Lawrence is, they compare it to like uh, in Austin. So uh, it's obviously much smaller than Austin. Not as many people live here, but uh Bunch of weirdos around here. It's it's awesome. It's I I could live in Lawrence for the rest of my life. I adapt really well to different environments. So I lived in Minnesota. I I know did a lot of winter sports. When I lived in California, played a lot of sand volleyball. And actually, there's a lot of hockey in Southern California. I could play pickup hockey when basically whenever I would, any day of the week. Play multiple adult leagues um, out here. There's one hockey rink that's like 35 minutes away, and I can't really. I skated, played hockey like once a year for like the past two years since I've lived here. But this is a, like a mecca for biking, uh, cycling. So uh, lots of I bought bought a mountain bike, bought a road bike, and I wake up early in the morning. This morning I did a little 20 miler, some brutal hills. Um, got home. Made breakfast, watched some Olympics, and then came into the lab. But uh, there's, I don't know, lots of music going around here in Lawrence, and lots of good food. And uh, yeah, if you're into cycling, this is a place to be. Uh, every single type of cycling you can imagine. Cyclocross. There's lots of gravel roads around here. Uh, mountain bike. Some of the mountain biking trails are uh, not so gnarly that you can't use a cyclocross bike on it and there's just mountain bike trails upon mountain bike trails everywhere here it's it's awesome so I've gotten into that and uh, I've really so when I was at Cal State Fullerton all I was doing was lifting weights and playing hockey I weighed like 175 pounds and don't tell don't tell anyone this you know don't let anyone from Fullerton watch this because you know, I'm an aerobic guy now so Weigh like under 150, but uh, you know, Strava me, bro, and uh, tell me it's not working. <laughs> the stuff we talk about is real about uh, endurance exercise. So you have big muscles; it's going to be difficult for that blood to get in there and deliver that oxygen. Um, and that weight can really, you know, kill you going up hills and stuff like that. But um, I'm competitive, so. I you know, get into things. I downloaded Strava, get me into trouble. I kind of, somehow I managed to taco my road bike tire. 
my road bike wheel the other day. Had to get a new road bike wheel because I talk with my road bike wheel. Just uh, getting a little too uh, squirrely going down this uh, path. But um, yeah, I, I do that. And uh, that's about it. And I'll head back to Minnesota to visit every now and again. I have a few buddies who live in Colorado, so I was just out there visiting them, go to conferences, hang out with you guys. It's one of my favorite times of the year. See everyone else, see what they're up to. And I was unfortunately, I wasn't able to go to NSCA this year. There's another conference, ISIC, uh, International Society of Electrophysiology and Kinesiology was in Chicago. The last time he was in the United States was like 2004 or something like that, so I had to jump at that, even though I've been to NSCA every year for like the past three or four years. Um, but, you know, if we can bring stuff, technology and statistical tools and software programming tools that are used in biomedical engineering and um, apply them to our field. We can do some pretty cool stuff, and especially if we have the athletes and the data out there. It's, there's a bunch of amazing tools that really are um, not used yet just because we, uh, we don't have the data to sift through. So, yeah, but hopefully graduating in like two years and moving on to the next chapter of my life see what happens. There's so many cool opportunities opening up in our field right now. Uh, and uh, having the background of, you know, being at Fullerton and, you know, having the applied knowledge and, you know, the experience of knowing what it's like to, you know, lift heavy or train aerobically or do a variety of different activities. Uh, and then learn how to do, learn everything there is to know about all these new types of stats, or old types of stats, actually. The things that are becoming popular, things that were popular in like the early 1900s are now becoming popular again, like Bayesian statistics are becoming popular again, um, which I don't even think has been published in Jaster, <laughs> uh, and he's studied using Bayesian statistics, so uh, there's a lot of cool statistics out there that, that allow us to say things we actually want to say, but can't say with um, traditional frequentist statistics. Um, and then like programming stuff can really open a lot of new doors and there's companies out there who are, you know, going to benefit from people who are really trying to, you know, further the field that way. Uh, I mean, look at all these wearable technology companies. Pretty much every shoe company wants to have a lab with people who are applied but have kind of like a technology I don't know, capacity and uh, yeah it's going to be a really cool time to be in our field in the next you know few decades yeah. before people get smart enough and realize that hey we can be entertained you know anything you can just watch like the Kardashians or something like that rather than watching sports whatever entertainment you want Maybe it'll be robots and we won't even have humans anymore and I have to go back to school for engineering or something like that. Albert, Albert, yeah. Albert I want to talk to you, dude. I haven't really talked to you for a while. Last time I talked to you, we were just uh, trying to figure yeah. out a camping trip or something like that. Or yeah. Or Beach. Oh, you know what? That was actually I was talking about. I, just, I was, like, actually having fond memories of I was going down to San Clemente, and I had, like, an hour or two to kill. And I'm like, hey, come and have a drink. And next thing you know, you, like, swoop me up. We go over to your place, which um, which is now not there anymore, I guess. <laughs> and we just had beers. And then next thing you know, is back on the train down to San Clemente. So that was a good time. I just remembered that. I don't know why. I was thinking about it this morning. Um, how do you go about, like, networking and stuff? Because a lot of... You take going to conferences really seriously. Like when you go, um, you I mean, think I do the things I do because I like networking. <laughs> no, I like. I think you like people, and it just so happens that some of the people that you like share the same interests that you have. Yeah. Well, here's. I like. I have FOMO when it comes to conferences. Or I used to have FOMO 
<laughs> when it comes to conferences, like I would be crazy. I'd be like upset about not being able, like, oh, there's two sessions that I want to go to, but I can only go to one. Like, what am I going to do? Like, I can't <laughs> believe this. So but you just plan them wrong sometimes too. Like that's how that happened at New Orleans. <laughs> I felt like that too. But uh, I I finally came to the realization that if this is really uh, important information, I'd hear it. I'd come about it some other way. Um, I mean, if someone was dropping some serious bombs at a conference, I'd see it on Twitter like almost instantly. Um, so I don't have to. <laughs> I'm not saying I haven't got it. I mean, I went to ACSM this past year and maybe went to like two talks or something like that. I walk around the poster presentations like, I don't know, like it's my job uh, because you can see, I don't know, how many, every single area of research and if you have a question, you can ask that person directly right there. Uh, I'll spend all my time around the posters before I go to any talks, if I go to any talks anymore. Um, but I can get... Uh, scientific information so easily by searching Google Scholar and if I'm truly interested in, in an area uh, I'm going to be up to date anyway so I mean that's another reason why here at Kansas I basically only take stats classes because if there's information related to something that I'm, that I'm researching that uh, I'm not aware of then I'm doing something wrong but it's really difficult to to gain new skills like programming and uh, stats, like new stats skills. So um, now when I go to conferences, it's basically just all about, and I'll, like I said, I'll, I'll walk through the posters and I'll have conversations with people, and that's a really good way to, to and maybe not even just calling it networking, but I, I think that you should... Yeah, take advantage of that for sure, because it's amazing how many amazing researchers are standing in one space, and you can talk to any of them. Um, but now when I go to conferences, I basically just try to see all my old friends, see what they're up to. When you meet up with your old friends, they have new friends and new colleagues that you meet, and uh, oh, that's I, I got this position here at Kansas because of who I knew and you know you get to a certain point and everyone looks the same on paper so who's going to get a job at this company? Someone who looks pretty much exactly the same as me on paper uh, and may or may not be a total square or if someone's able to say oh yeah Tony is Super cool, very personable. You'll love working with them. Uh, why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they take me, or why wouldn't they take the person who has some sort of connection where someone can say yes? You know, you're not gonna have any issues with this person. They're uh, just a good all-around person, and you'll like being around them because uh, so much of you know any job is um, gonna be related to who you're around, and you know not around the right people, uh, you might not, I don't know, enjoy yourself. It, it just, you know, affects every aspect of work. One or two people being difficult can totally ruin a work environment, a uh, research environment. It's just, it's crazy. Yeah, you know? I just heard a pretty, I heard a pretty cool quote, and I'm, I'm going to probably attribute it to the wrong person, but I think it was Bo Shen Beckler that says, you know what, if I lose a good recruit, I only lose um, one time a year to that kid, but if I recruit the wrong person, I can lose every day because yeah. of the kid's attitude. I don't know if it's Bush and Black Girl. I, I heard that somewhere, but maybe it's someone at Ohio State. Yeah, so uh, I think it all wrong. I don't know. I I think I went to when I was at ACSM in Boston. I met a lot of a lot of people, and actually a lot of NSCA people. And you go to the conferences, you see the same people, and but you only really have conversations. You have the realest conversations with people if maybe you've had a few drinks or something like that, but you're never going to have those conversations with people if you're just, I don't know, going to talks and uh, not going to poster presentations. You have, you're in a, a room with a bunch of people. It's not really a conducive environment for real conversations. Uh, but 
I, I, I feel like I, I figured out the, uh, the recipe just, <laughs> and, and you're gonna enjoy yourself more, you know, I've been to too many conferences where I just spent the entire day trying to go to as many talks as I possibly could, when maybe I should have just gone to posters and then, uh, you know, gone out and hung out with Wheeland and met his new colleagues from uh, UNLV or uh, met with the, I don't know, people who do neuromuscular research at other universities like um, Oklahoma State or University of Oklahoma. Um, networking is everything and pretty much every job. And uh, luckily, you can just go to Cal State Fullerton and pretty much meet everyone you could possibly need to know to get a job somewhere. So. <laughs> I don't know. You guys have any other questions? You want to know, like, what if I'm wearing pants right now? If I'm just wearing this polo? Just, <laughs> no. Just yeah, wearing the men of Florida. I'll leave it up to you guys. You guys can use your imaginations. That's what we were talking about yesterday. I'm like, we can pretty much just show up with like in our underwear, and no one's gonna know because we're both. This is the first time we both worked from home, so. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think anyone here from Kansas will ever watch this. At least any students, I don't think. Uh, I taught an online stats class this summer and made an intro video. Uh, I guess right when I posted, or when I made everything live online and I posted this video saying, you know, kind of who I am and, you know, so the students can kind of put a personality. Because I've been told, so I teach a clinical exercise physiology type class, ACSM type class as well, and uh, students going into that class had me for undergrad stats, which is online, and I answer emails very straightforward, almost like, it's not quite Dr. Brown level, but very straightforward. And it makes it seem, apparently it makes it seem like I'm a total hard ass uh, who's like very, very, basically not who I am is what it comes down to. And uh, they're like, yeah, you're just a really, you know, fun person to be around. And, uh, you know, your emails don't make it seem like that. So I made this video, right? And I just put on a polo and had like gym shorts on. I don't know about me. It's it's amazing. You don't. You know, it's true. People do it. I imagine that everyone now who makes a podcast is not wearing pants. <laughs> uh, I've, I've figured out. There's no way. They're just they're wearing like gym shorts or something like that. Maybe you should start using emojis in your emails. Me yeah, you smiley I really, face. I really should. Or <laughs> something like that. Gifts. Yeah. <laughs> So now that I know you, you taught stats, do you have any advice? I'm, I'm teaching stats for the first time this semester and a little nervous. Yeah. Everyone's going to hate you no matter what. You're yeah. Teaching stats. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, I teach large sections of, of stats now. Like summer is nice because I only get like 14, 15 students, but in the fall semester I'll have like 120 students. So it's crazy. Um, the first time I taught it, I didn't have any like, you have homework assignments. Those are the most difficult. This is when you know your life is hard. It's when you have assignments because either you have them do it by hand, and it's just a real pain to grade. It's almost like okay, I'm gonna put these in stacks of in order of kind of mostly right to mostly wrong, and then grade them that way. That's almost like the only thing you can do. But uh, online, I have students. And this is also something to allow the students to become familiarized with Excel, which is an incredibly useful tool in pretty much any job. So have them do the assignments in Excel. And the first assignments, I'm, you know, basically, they're simple assignments. But like calculating means and standard deviations and stuff like that. Uh, but they're learning how to use all these functions in Excel. And a lot of screenshots and step-by-step, uh, -step, this is how you do this. Um, but then once it comes to actually doing assignments, from Dr. Weir's Statistics and Kinesiology book. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have boxes that are kind of like checkpoints. Okay, if you've gotten this number, you've done everything correct up to this point, which will save you hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of time looking through people's spreadsheets to help them 
complete the assignment before it's due. So they can kind of police themselves to a, to a certain extent. Uh, if they're totally lost, then you might have to help them out. But a lot of times it's just something simple that they've forgotten. And they if they have the correct answer for some of these checkpoints, then it allows them to, to go through and try to figure it out themselves rather than just be like, ah, I can't figure this out. I'm going to email Tony and you know send him my spreadsheet to help me out. Uh, but there's stats is one of those things. It's going to be a polarizing class. Stats, X-Fizz, biomechanics. Your grade distribution is going to be like, it's going to be bimodal. We're talking about stats, right? Um, there's going to be a cluster around like, the C, B minus range, and there's going to be a cluster at like the A range. Some people are going to think, oh my god, this is like the easiest thing in the world. I can't understand how people don't get this. Um, but it's just, it's just numbers. Uh, numbers are always going to be like that. Uh, some things just, people have a mind for numbers, and some people apparently don't have a mind for numbers. But, you know, uh, I'd say if possible, if the class is small enough, um, just try to reach out. The earlier you can reach out to students who are having trouble, the better. Um, because once people start getting frustrated with something like stats, it's just it's just going to be like pulling teeth, and it's going to be it's like a I don't know, they like gain downhill speed and just go downhill so much <laughs> faster. And there, and honestly, stats there's there are a few basic concepts that if you understand, you can get a lot of questions right. But if you don't understand a few basic concepts, then you can get like almost everything wrong. So making sure that like people understand, oh, if the uh, p is less than alpha, that's uh, you're um, accepting null hypothesis. Accepting null hypothesis is you know saying that there is no or p is less than alpha. There's uh, you're rejecting null hypothesis. Hey, I already screwed it up. Rejecting null hypothesis. There's a statistical difference. Like those three things are all basically saying the same thing. And if you get any one of those wrong, then you're going to get the answer wrong. But if you actually, if you get two of them wrong, then you're going to get the answer right. So I've seen that before too. Um, but it's there's a lot of technical things and making sure that uh, the most basic principles and things I think should be more visual. I wish someone would have, um, when I was learning stats, I like to think about comparing things uh, comparing two groups or two time points, looking at distributions. So, you know, what happens to this distribution if the standard deviation is increased? What happens to these two distributions if the mean difference is increased? Um, and thinking about it, okay, well, these distributions are maybe more over, overlap a little bit more. That's, okay, obviously it's less likely that they're going to be statistically different, but all the test questions and quiz questions are purely conceptual because that's what's important, is understanding what happens. What would happen if I increased the sample size? That's an important thing to know. What would happen if I increased the variance in these scores? I mean, is it more likely that I find statistical difference? What would happen if, you know, practical things like that? Not just, oh, you know, how do you convert a standard deviation into a standard error of the mean? Uh, there are standard errors. And stuff like that is just going to be totally brutal. I think it should be very, very applied and conceptual. Very conceptual. I don't think there should be like hardly any math questions that are, that are asked on actual tests. But homework assignments, you know, homework assignments is what I started doing. So this is me like, <laughs> um, so the first time I taught it, I thought that a lot of people didn't understand these things I'm talking about and all the test questions. So this, this is the, my eval, right? Um, the types of questions that are asked on the test are not representative of what we do in homework. But they're doing, like actually doing the calculations in the homework. And then, but what I think they're doing is just like, okay, I do this, okay, I do that, okay, I got the right answer, sweet, done. But that's not the important part. The important part is you have, now you have this spreadsheet that you can alter you can change the data. What happens if I add um, a higher value to this group? Okay, how does that affect the F ratio? What happens if I, you know, take away all of subject 10's data? What happens? I mean, I can just change the sample size. What happens to the F ratio? You have this spreadsheet where you can start doing those things now. So now, 
since I basically give them the answer to the spreadsheet, now they have to answer questions in sentence format. Okay, write one sentence describing what would happen, how you could change the data set to increase the F ratio. How can you change the data set to decrease the critical F? Uh, things like that. So now they have to start really thinking about why the statistical outcomes are the way they are, not just, okay, this is a magical value that I got because I plugged the right equations into Excel. Good. Well, I'm probably going to keep contacting you with that stat that I <laughs> But everyone's going to hate you no matter what. Like, yeah. That's, that's, just, that's okay. It's okay. It comes with the territory. I'm going to try and make it more fun. Let them experiment on some of the strength lab equipment. Yeah, stats um, fun. Good luck. <laughs> Um, so I have a really quick question from one viewer and then a kind of wrap-up question. One question is, and I'm sure you'll know who it's from, uh, he wants to know if you have a new drug cup. A new what? Drug cup. Drug cup? Yeah. A drug cup. Oh, oh my god. Yeah, I do. What? Is, is it new? Yeah, it's new because my, uh, yeah, I don't use Dixie or uh, Solo cups anymore. I, <laughs> I remember this, dude. I just remember there's a big scandal when someone threw away your cup. Environmental friendly. It's it's uh well my old drug cup was reusable until someone threw it away. Sure. It, um, yeah, this one's washable because I totally wash it. Um, it's a little bit more firm, but uh, yeah, I can put a bunch of caffeine in here too with my water and drink that. So this is my new caffeine drug cup. That's what, not real drugs. We're talking about, you know, performance-enhancing academic drugs. There you you still, yeah, do you still have up. the uh, caffeine powder that alarms a lot of people if they don't know it's caffeine powder? Yeah, they, uh, they don't sell it on uh, Amazon anymore. You've <laughs> got to go to a, a really, like, legit-sounding website. You know it just has the best quality products uh, you could possibly buy. It's called Powder City. Um, so I buy my drugs from Powder City. Actually, I haven't bought new caffeine because it's so cheap and there's so much of it that I still have the same the same bag. I don't know if that's I don't know if my like caffeine like molecules or the molecular structure of my caffeine is changing, but uh, I don't know. I should probably look into that. It's probably too old, but it seems to work still. I mean, yeah. Well, we've, been, we've gone for more than an hour, dude, so we're going to let you get to your life. So Whitney likes to do, ask the wrap-up question. But I want you to stay on so we can start talking about our, our camping trip. Yes. Um, so the wrap-up question is the advice that you may have for um, students either graduating with their bachelor's or their master's or even thinking about going into PhD, what is your advice that you would give to them? To um, do what will what drives you and what will always be interesting to you. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that if there's something you have to do to get to an end goal and you don't like that, then just don't do it. I'm not saying that. You're going to have to do things you might necessarily want to do, but uh, always remember what got you going and uh, what, what you'll always be interested in. I'm not saying you're always going to be interested in the same topic, but you know, I'm always going to be interested in applied for science. Um, and it's so easy in our field to get pulled in a different direction when you think about things like money or um, like prestige or something like that. Do you, you can, you know, get your bachelor's in exercise science and go get your BNMD. Yeah. You can go to PT school, go to PA school, OT school. You can be a nurse. You can go all these different routes. Um, and there's nothing wrong with any route. There's nothing wrong with any job. But why do you want to do that job? You know, you do, do everything for the right reasons. Um, don't just do it because you think you're supposed to do something. Um, it's my biggest pet peeves. I don't know. If I was talking, ranting with Albert about that. Um, People who are are the way they are because I feel like because I perceive that they're doing it because they think that that's who they're supposed to be, not necessarily who they want to be, um, who they think they're supposed to be. Just 
honestly, if you're doing what you want to do, you're going to be the most successful you could possibly be. And people say that. Just do what you want to do to a certain extent. You know, be realistic. I'm not going to be like an astrophysicist ever. I'm not smart enough to do that. I'm not going to be an NBA player, 5'7". Um, but, you know, you have to do the things that you're actually truly interested in. Otherwise, sooner or later, you're going to wish that you'd done something else. Or you're going to wish that, oh, man, um, I, I really screwed up and maybe I, I should have you know, taking that chance. Um, but if you can figure out, you know, an excuse. Actually, I was talking with my advisor about this. Like, one of his cousins or something, niece, said that, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not accepted to this OT program in Oregon. He's like, well, why don't you apply to other OT programs? Um, when you apply for something and you're trying to achieve a goal, if you really want that thing, you'll do whatever you need to do to get that thing. Yes. And you're able to, if you say, well, I don't think I would um, excel uh, anywhere other than in Oregon, um, then maybe you're choosing the wrong thing, because obviously you don't want it enough to take any chance or make any sacrifice, but if you really want it, then you'll do everything you need to do to actually get it. So, and it goes so many different things in life. I don't need to have a freaking philosophical conversation here. But if you really wanted something, if you really wanted to keep something, then you do everything in your power to have that thing. And if you're finding that, you know, you're easily able to make an excuse of why that you don't want to go do that or take this chance, then maybe you're choosing the wrong thing. But, um, and if you are going to try to do something, like, fully commit to it, and you might have to take, you know, a financial hit here and there, but if you get to the right spot and you're around the right people, um, that's what's going to allow you to succeed in what you want to do. Um, so aiming for the top, like, if you want to be in, you know, applied exercise physiology, then you better be going to one of the best applied exercise physiology programs that you can possibly get into. Um, otherwise, you're you're choosing to set yourself back, or you're choosing to have to start from a tougher spot when you don't have to. You know, yeah, and you only know what you know. So I don't know if I would succeed, if I would thrive anywhere other than Oregon. Well. How do you know that? You only know what you know. You can. If you never try something, you're never going to know. If you've only been programming the same way your whole life, you're never going to know how great one of your athletes could have been. Oh, maybe I should have tried this. Well, it's too late. <laughs> yeah. But it's easy for me to say that because I got lucky. I, I shouldn't say that I got lucky. I, I feel like it's, you know, part luck, part, you know, you take a few chances. And I will say this for everyone who's an undergrad out there. <laughs> I wouldn't have got into Cal State Fullerton if uh, if I had applied, I don't know, like last year or a few years ago. My GPA was a 2.82 <laughs> coming out of undergrad. And I had, I think I had actually got my first B plus this past semester um, since then. So I don't know, like five years of like straight A's, 4.0. So, but it's like if you're interested in something and you're truly interested in it, it's not going to be like pulling teeth, uh, you know, gaining knowledge about this thing. But if you're not interested in something, yeah, it's going to suck. You have to, oh, I have to, I hate having to memorize all these tendons and blood vessels in the hand if you're going to go to PT school. Well, the PTs do. You have to know about that stuff. So if you hate it, then maybe you chose the wrong thing. Uh, and maybe you didn't. Maybe you just, you know, have to take that lump and move on. But, yeah. Well, let's get let's talking, get to you, dude. We're going to wrap it up. Oh, my God. What's that echo? So stay on then. Yeah. 
hopefully we'll come back on again. We'll probably do like a panel type thing, but appreciate taking your time out of your day. Oh, it was, it was good. I mean, I'd probably just be sitting at my desk making, furthering my transcranial spreadsheet, which, uh, you know, that honestly, it's, it's a... I've been I've studied under Dan, right, who has this crazy freaking method of like making note cards and putting them all out on the floor and doing this just really time consuming stuff. And this is kind of like a hybrid method. Like you want everything to be there, but you don't need to make four hundred freaking note cards. I mean, there's relevant information, you're gonna be smart enough to know if information's relevant or not. So you can pick that stuff out, put it in a spreadsheet. I mean, it's a lot more manageable than having like 400 freaking note cards. And uh, but um, yeah, I would never. You only know what you know, and take things from you know one person. And you don't have to be exactly like your advisor or mentor. I mean, study under three people now, and I know their weaknesses and strengths, and I'll try to take the best things I can uh, take from all of them. Um, but, yeah, I'd, I would probably just be sitting sitting around. I, I come in so late now in the summers to lab because I go for, like, long bike rides and then at, like, sunrise. And sunrise is getting later now. So leave at, like, 6.30, get back home at, like, 8.00. Um, make breakfast, recover. For I'm, like, gonna, I'm gonna stop the the broadcast right now. Oh, this is. Uh, the we can keep talking.